Hey there, hey, welcome back. My name is Jody Scholes. I'm your instructor for the Mblex review course. You guys continue to amaze me, honestly, as independent students, like independent students, you are not going to a brick and mortar school right now. You are coming here. You're coming to this classroom. And you know what? That takes some great initiative. For real. You guys just, I mean, I send you a little greeting often, you know, during the week and, and on Mondays. And, um, and I, I say something like, you know, to the talented, terrific, tough group of future licensed massage therapists. And I mean that. Just by showing up today, honestly, just by showing up, whether you have your camera on or off, whether you're watching live or recorded, whether you are in the chat or you're not, whether you answer questions correctly or not, physically by your presence in this vibration, in this energy, in this online classroom, right now, here and now, you have chosen to send a message to the universe. By your physical presence here right now, you are sending a message to the universe that says, bring it, bring it. I'm ready for this. I'm ready to be a licensed massage therapist. And you know what? I was writing in my book just this week about how no growth happens in our comfort zone right? Our little comfort zone that we, we kind of build around us. And we sometimes surround ourselves with people who are like, oh, you're so great. And yet there's that little itch, that little spark inside of you that says, I want to take this test. I want to pass this test. Not everyone's wired like you. Not everyone is comfortable with growth, but here's the irony, right? Because growth isn't comfortable. As I was writing about this week in, the, in my book, no growth happens in our current comfort zone. We actually have to take a baby step, just a baby step outside the comfort zone. We've got to risk the money. It's almost 300 bucks to take this Mblex, right? I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to lay down 300 bucks for just throwing it away, you know? And yet there's that spark, that little fire. Maybe it's growing a little warmer. Maybe you're tasting it just a little bit. Maybe you're starting to see yourself like, oh, once I get this, what can I do with this? I could, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the going rate right now, for independent practice, for, for just the going rate in our industry right now, I say our industry, in our profession, the massage therapy profession, it's, you know, therapists will earn anywhere from 30 to $100 an hour. It's a pretty wide range, right? But 30 to 130, if everybody else pays the bills. If you're an employee, Someone else is paying your taxes. Someone else is paying the rent. Someone else is providing your sheets. Someone else is booking your appointments. You can count on 30, 35, maybe even 40 bucks an hour. And you don't have to do anything but show up, punch in, do your work, build your business, punch out. Your biggest responsibility, other than putting your hands on people, is to rebook them. Don't get me started about rebooking. You rebook every single one of your clients. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. So that's on the lower end, 30, 40 bucks an hour. That's pretty good. You see five clients a week. That's a couple hundred bucks a week. You know, you decide to see six clients a week. You got, you know, 800 to a thousand bucks in income and someone else is paying your taxes. Now, if you want to do everything yourself, and you want to go find your clients, you want to book all your appointments, you want to either set up a home office or rent a brick and mortar location, you want to launder all your sheets, 
Um, you want to do your marketing. Mm, that's just the start of things. Then you can work on your own and then you can charge a hundred bucks an hour. But let me assure you, your net is still about 30 to $40 an hour. <laughs> After you pay your rent and you, you know, spend your hours, you know, posting on social media, building a website, designing a brochure, getting back to clients, going to meetings. Blah. Yeah. The six hours a week you work turns into about 60. Now, many people go the independent route and are very successful, but I want to start to paint that picture for you. Because when you're in a traditional school, maybe when you went through school, your school brought in um, panelists that were from a franchise, uh, independent massage therapist, um, you know, maybe an employee, uh, people who, who approached, maybe somebody who worked at a hospital. But in school, I wanted to, to just shake off your memories of did you explore the avenues, the different avenues, other than being a sole proprietor, other than just being an entrepreneur? Did you explore those other avenues of you know, what it meant to, you know, to, to do massage? Because you can do massage at a hospital. You can do massage at a retirement home. You can do massage at a great big high rise. If you live in a city, those high rise buildings often have yoga rooms and massage rooms. The big differentiation is whether you are a employee or you are an independent contractor. Independent contractor, sole proprietor, you know, someone doesn't take them, um, you work for someone, but you're an independent contractor or you work for yourself. You, know, you look at paying quarterly taxes. When you're an independent contractor or a sole prop proprietor, that means you have a tax bill. That means you either will pay your taxes once a year, and we're in tax season right now, right? You'll either pay your taxes once a year or you will pay your taxes, right? Because you haven't paid any taxes. You're a 1099, right? I see people like, oh, they don't take my, they, I make 70 bucks an hour, but they don't take any, any money out of my check. You want them to take money out of your check. You want them to pay your taxes because as an employee, you get a form called a W-2. And I'm sure many of you have been employees for in other professions where you've gotten your W-2, which tells you what you've earned for the year. And guess what else that W-2 tells you? Your refund. Mm-hmm. As an employee, you get a refund. As an independent contractor, you get a bill. So just be careful. As you move into, we're very, you know, we're not quite in the home stretch of our classes, but our next class together in this setting, if you're watching this, you know, uh, well, in this setting, we're going into the month of March. And when we go into the month of March, that reminds me to tell you it's time to march forward. It's time to march forward, March 4th and March 4th. You march forth and you sign up to take that MLEX. And in our first segment today, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. I spend the first 10, 12 minutes of class talking about the actual test. And the next 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes, we talk about content. And today we're doing anatomy and physiology, upper body. Yeah, I know. Yeah, upper body, Yahoo. We're gonna cover, we're gonna cover navigating the body in our content section today. And then the last part of class, the last 10, 12, 15 minutes of class, we're dissecting questions. And that's the structure of our class every time. We talk about the emblex because it is just as important, maybe more important, that you understand the emblex. It may be more important that you actually understand the test than it is to regurgitate content. Yes, the content is important and I'm not saying it's not, but you've been through school, it's in there. You're going through this class, it's in there. 
You're learning how to dissect questions. You've got a test taking strategy. Understanding this test is a part of this process. I wanna share with you just a little something. <laughs> this is the page that you'll go to when you go to register for your test. And as we enter into um, the, the last third of our time together, so we're about over 50% of the way through this class, this is when you start thinking, it's time to get registered to take this test. And I don't know if Zoom will let me go to a new page, but we're gonna try it. So we're gonna go to the application process. Did it change? Give me, give me a thumbs up if it changed. Did you get a new screen? Because I can unshare and then share again. Yeah, so let me just see if I still have this one up. Okay, I'm gonna stop my share for just a second because I opened this page just in case it didn't. All right, so I unshared. There we go. Thank you for your patience. All right. So this is the MBLEX process. And you can see this nice and clearly. It has worked before. Okay, so the application, oh, there we go. The application is your first step. But the very first step to make your application is you, you open an account. So have a little piece of paper ready for your username and your password. so that you can jot that down. You're going to need to use that username and password again to get in to check your status. Okay, my Zoom is telling me you can see me, just double checking. You can see, it says application step two processing. I will send you this link after, after class so that you can review it again. But your application is you're gonna go to this page, this federation page. You're gonna click on MBLEX, application process or application requirements right in here. This is the what we're outlining in this. So you should see at least four, if not six blue boxes on your screen right now. Cool. All right, so you're gonna create an account and you're going to complete your application process. There's just, a, it's a simple application. They're gonna ask, you know, where did you go to school? That type of thing. Processing after they receive your application and your payment, which is, you know, like I said, almost $300. This, they promise they will process you within five business days. After you are processed. And if you wanna check on your status, that's when you log back in to check, okay, have they processed me? Have they processed me? Have they processed me? But you know, after five days, they will have. That is when you get your authorization to test. Once they process, you get something called the at t your authorization to test. And you'll get that via email. Here's where the clock starts ticking. Step three, once you get your authorization to test, you have 90 days. You have 90 days to pick your day and time and location. So authorization to test arrives in your email, 90 days to do step number four, schedule your MBLEX. And you can schedule online, you can call toll free. You will be going to a Pearson View Testing Center. And some of you have done this already. So. Thank you for letting me review this with you. Um, but I just want to re-familiarize yourself with what's going to be happening. Now is the time. We're over halfway through our classes. Now is the time we start thinking, when is it going to happen? Because your finish line is this process. And this is where some students freeze. And so it's my job to kick you in the rump. And to get you out of that comfort zone to move you outside this is the baby step out of the comfort zone your application you're going to schedule your mblex 
you'll get a confirmation from the Pearson View Testing Center of your time and appointment. And then you're gonna show up. You're gonna show up 30 minutes early and we've walked through the experience of what your test day is gonna look like. We've walked through the experience of what the week before your test is gonna look like. But you will show up on game day and you will practice your fundamentals. This is where you show up 30 minutes early. You're gonna throw all your stuff in a locker. You're gonna have two hours, technically an hour and 15 minutes to complete your test. So you'll take the MBLEX. And the one thing that they didn't mention is how you're going to celebrate. Whoop, whoop. How you're gonna celebrate after you take your MBLEX. Yeah. How you're gonna celebrate. So you're gonna take your test and plan your celebration. Who are you gonna call? Who are you gonna, are you gonna have a nice dinner? You know? And as I mentioned, this is part of your journey. And I'm gonna repeat this for the next six weeks. You're gonna show up to your test. You're gonna show up on what I call game day and you're gonna practice the fundamentals. And that's my, that's the, that's the mission of this MBLEX review class is to give you back your fundamentals. There are many high school football teams who, who have a professional football team nearby and they go and watch practice. Imagine going to watch a professional football team practice. Really exciting, right? Imagine going to watch, we'll say professional soccer team since we've got soccer people in the house. What do all professional athletes do? They practice the fundamentals. You see NBA players doing sprints. You see professional football players doing sprints. You see professional soccer players doing warm-ups on the side, on the sidelines. They're practicing the fundamentals. And that's what this class is about, giving you back your fundamentals. Yeah. And when you get to test day, that's your game day. Practice the fundamentals. You show up early. You, know, you got a good night's sleep. You show up early. You, imp you implement your strategy, your test taking strategies. You breathe. You read the question. You eliminate two wrong answers. You pick the best answer. The fundamentals. So that's our walk through the MBLEX uh, experience for you today. A reminder, and that may be even something you want to just have on the tip of your tongue. You, know, you do your application process. You get your authorization to test. You get your confirmation of when you're testing. And as you're walking into the Pearson View Testing Center, your mantra, part of it, practice the fundamentals. I am a licensed massage therapist. I practice the fundamentals. Because you're getting them here. You're getting them here. Bang. All right, speaking of the fundamentals, we do need to know some anatomy and physiology. Yeah, <laughs> go figure, right? Um, eh, you know, being a massage therapist, be nice if you knew some uh, anatomy, physiology, that'll work. Let's transition into anatomy and physiology review. And then we're gonna dissect some questions. Whoop, whoop, oh, this thing. Sorry guys, it blocks me, there we go. All right, welcome back. Welcome back. Remember, uh, welcome back, Cotter? Welcome back. We've talked about the regions of the body. Just want to remind you of those regions of the body. Just with this slide, we're not going to walk through them. But as you are looking at your test questions, sometimes they refer to regions of the body. In the femoral region, 
femur, femoral, in the pelvic region, the pelvic basin, in the cervical region, okay? Yes. Those are, are pretty much the, in the cranial region. You may see a chromial. A chromium refers to that uh, a chromium process. It's a shoulder region, the scapular, that's also a shoulder region. So showing you these to get that back into your vocabulary, back into your more, more recent awareness. Let's take a look again at the directions and positions. We're gonna also cover the planes of the body one more time. So we've got posterior and anterior, posterior behind, anterior ahead, sternum, spine, anterior towards the sternum, posterior towards the spine, front and back, right guys? Front and back. Medial down the middle, right? Medial, M, middle, midline of the body. We care about that because of anatomical position. What's closer to the midline of the body is medial. What is further away from the midline of the body is lateral. Quick review on superficial and deep. Superficial. Closer to the surface of the body. Deep. Farther away from the surface of the body. Some students, some graduates of massage school, some graduates um, of uh, body work institutes get a little tripped up on proximal and distal. We have to go back to anatomical position. I fully expect during your test taking experience, at some point you will stick your hands out, your palms will be forward, your thumbs will be up and you'll be like, okay, I'm in anatomical position, <laughs> right? Feet facing forward, you don't have to stand, you can stand if you want. But in anatomical position, where you're sitting right now, if you're not driving, you know, stick your arms out to your sides, thumbs towards the ceiling, palms forward. This is anatomical position. So from anatomical position, what is proximal? What is distal? Proximal is closer or above what's higher. And it's normally used with limbs. So legs and arms. The elbow is proximal to the wrist. The wrist is distal, farther away from the body, farther away from the midline of the body, but farther away. Two points on the body, which is higher, which is lower. So my nose is proximal to my chin. My chin is distal to my nose. Okay, knee, knee is proximal to the foot. The ankle is distal to the knee. All right, moving along. Wanted to review the ribs and the thorax. The ribs that move the rib cage are in between the rib bones, the costals, also known as the costals. And I wanted to remind you, yeah. I sure, uh, yep, I sure will, Chet, I'll do that again. I'm getting a request to do the rib nose thing again. So uh, we'll do it right after the ribs and thorax. So the ribs, the thorax, the thoracic, the thorax, the thoracic, all of the ribs attached to the spine. All of the ribs make up the thoracic spine. Now, qualify that, right? If you take your ribs and you follow them back to your spine, those ribs, those 12 ribs define the thoracic spine. They all attach there. But the movement of the ribs, we see up, ele um, elevation, inhalation, our ribs move up and they expand. It makes sense that they expand, right? When we inhale, they expand, they also move up. And then when we exhale, they come down and they, get, they come together. So inhale, up and out, exhale, down and in. 
So just the movement of those ribs. And before we leave this page, what are the muscles of the in-between? If you can type safely, you can put in the chat, um, what are the muscles in between the ribs called? Hmm? I'll give you guys a moment. Muscles in between the ribs. Let's see, I don't have any, I don't have any answers yet. Oh yeah, oh yeah, here they come, here they come. Boom shakalaka. Answer, the intercostal muscles, correct. Very good, Chet, got that one right on the screen. You were first in the chat on that one. All right, intercostals, right? In between the costals, intercostals are uh, those, those muscles between the ribs. Let's go back for a moment, if I can figure out how to do that. There we go. And we were talking about distal and proximal. And you'll see here, proximal is simply up, above. What is above? Distal is what is below. We often use these in terms of anatomical position. The body, in all of these directions, we assume the body is in anatomical position, okay? Um, and so proximal is above. So my nose is proximal to my chin. It's above it. My so, shoulders. So Jody. Yeah. So Jody. Mm -hmm. So it's not towards the center of the body. No, that's just, that's going to be medial and lateral. We're talking. Yes, it is. Because I'm just trying is. to say the middle of your butt or the center of your body. So your nose is not distal to your chin. Oh, I understand what you're saying now. Yes, because I'm not using midline of the body, right, at all. Yeah. I'm doing, up, yeah. So technically proximal and distal are upper and lower, technically. Here's where we look at best answer. Because often proximal and distal are used with limbs. And so with our limbs, we have to just go into anatomical position. Because if I raise my arms over my head, that's a different positioning, right? My, my wrists at this point are gonna, be prox are gonna be distal. They're still away. It is away from the midline of the body, but be aware that sometimes your questions are going to be about, the, uh, about not the limbs. So if we're talking about limbs, the, the furthest out. So that is away from the midline of the body, the furthest out. But look at knee and ankle. Knee and ankle are another example of proximal and distal. The knee is above the ankle. Technically our feet are a little wider, right? In anatomical position, we're hip width apart. You know, we're not standing in military position. And so, Yes, it, it is closer to the midline, but when we talk about midline, look up here in the right-hand corner. We're talking medial and lateral. Yeah, but I'm not talking midline. I'm talking from the center of the body. You know, so I'm trying to figure out how, if you're looking at the center of the body, and I guess I'm kind of confused because, mm -hmm. I mean, your head is kind of an appendage, even though it's an axle. Yes, yeah. But 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 it's, 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 if I always go to the, I guess I kind of look at the thorax as the center of your body. Mm-hmm. And so your nose is distal to your chin. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's outside. Yeah. Well, let's skip that example because we do have one of our test questions, uh, one of our dissecting the questions will give us a different example. And let's come back to that with nose and chin. Okay. okay? Yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, I picked a question uh, for, with this in mind, cause it can be confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So sit, stick with me and we'll get to those, uh, questions in about maybe five, 10 minutes. Yeah. Cause we never get through this stuff. We never go through it enough. You know what I mean? It, it it's yes. I, I, if the head was an appendage, <laughs> you would be right, but let's, let's, uh, let's move along. Cause it's, it's a little bit different. So we did ribs. 
Let's move along to just review a couple movements of the body that can be a little, um, can be used in different parts of the body. And so I wanted to just give you a couple reminders of the example. Shoulder circumduction. That is 360, right? With our shoulder, we can go all the way around and we can go forward or backward, right? We circumduct and it's a cone-like figure. Circumduction, the cone, the, the, the skinny part of the cone is your shoulder, your actual shoulder joint. And the big part of the cone, cone or the funnel is the movement you can make at the distal part of your arm. <laughs> All right, so lateral flexion, as if we move across here, can occur in different parts of the body, two different parts of the body in particular, the neck and the trunk. We're just gonna take a quick look at both. So lateral flexion, if you were standing up, now this guy happens to be laying down, but if you're standing up and you're laterally flexing your neck, you're just bringing your ear towards your shoulder. Lateral flexion of the neck, right? We're gonna see lateral flexion of the trunk in a minute. But lateral flexion of the neck is ear towards the shoulder. Ear towards the shoulder. Lateral, we're in the lateral, so we're moving the lateral flexion. Okay. An easier one up here in the upper right hand corner elevation and depression. Up, elevation like the elevator. D, down, depression like not feeling good, depression. Elevate, elevation elevates. So you elevate your scapulas. You depress your mandible. And this is just terminology. Okay, supination and pronation. Okay, so we talked about this a few weeks ago, but I wanted to bring it back to you because it's a big one. Supination, look, turning that palm up. So the movement is actually palm up, that's supination. If you look at the diagram here, uh, number 1.23, it's turning the palm up, that's supination of the forearm. When we begin a massage, if we have that client face up, they are in supine position. Why is that? Their palms are face up. The movement though, so the position on the body, on a massage table, face up is supine. Supination of the forearm is turning the palm up. Turning that palm up. Likewise, when you have your client on the massage table and they're face down, they are in prone position. When we take that, for, uh, we take that palm and we turn it down, that's pronation of the forearm. All right, supine on the table, face up, palm up, prone on the table, face down, palm down. Movement of pronation is palm down. Okay. All right, we wanna get home stretch here, home stretch, and then we'll go into our questions. All right, a couple other common movements of the body. We're looking at inversion and eversion. Here, 1.25, inversion, turning that, that, that sole of the foot, the bottom part of the foot. When we turn that in, that is inversion. There is an opposite movement to inversion, and it's difficult to, to move our own body in this way. Figure 1.26 right here, and thank you to Trail Guide to the Body for permission uh, in using this art. I'm really grateful. Position 1.26 shows E, eversion, eversion, E, 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 eversion of the foot. That's everting. And that's here's where some graduates of massage school get a little confused because if you're pigeon toed, 
that is a different that is a different position. So I'm going to take my hands and I'm going to evert, right? So if we roll our feet in, so they're facing forward to start and we roll them in, lifting that outside part, that lateral part of the foot. That is eversion. It's very, it's actually a really difficult movement to make. Try it. If you're in a safe place, try bringing the sides of your foot up. It's really awkward. But try rolling your feet out, inverting those, the soles of your foot. So you're inverting the sole of your foot. That's the movement. Now, of those two movements, which do you think happens more often in a sprain or a strain? Inversion or eversion? Do you think it's inversion sprain? Like, oh, I, my ankle roll. So the ankle rolls out, but the sole of the foot rolls up. So that roll out. And then in, in, in the E version, E, like Edward, E, the foot rolls in, like you, you, you're moving in. Oh, you have answers. Yes. 85% of sprains or strains are, are inversion sprains. So you've inverted the foot, the ankle has rolled out, the pressure, because it's so much easier to do with your foot, right? So you're actually on the sides of your feet. So imagine you're doing a stretch we call the butterfly stretch. That's the soles of your feet are touching. And if you're standing and, or you're sitting and the soles of your feet are touching, you're in an inverted position. All right, I think that's enough. Okay. I can beat that, roll, roll the tape back if you need to hear it again. All right, all right. And so we're looking now at images here and here, 1.27 and 1.28. We're looking at flexion and extension. Flexion and extension. Yes, thank you for that note. Eversion strains are more um, damaging. My, my chat goes away pretty quick, but um, the inversion strains are more common. The eversion strains are more damaging. Here we are moving into flexion and extension. Excellent, we're moving along at a good clip today, guys. All right, flexion and extension. So it may seem a little funny, um, but when you flex your foot, you are pointing your foot. Flexion and extension. All right. So, excuse me, flexion is 1.28 right here. Flexion, bringing it back. I'm flexing my front of my flexion. Extension, otherwise known as pointing the toe. Extending. I'm extending how long my leg is. I'm extending. Now, some people use this differently in the gym or in ballet, um, but I want to tell you the anatomically correct, when we extend our toes, we extend the muscles, we're making it longer, we're pushing down the gas pedal, we're extending the reach. When we take our foot off the gas pedal, we're flexing, we're having to flex our, the front of our leg muscles, do it now, pull your toes up, you're flexing those muscles to bring your toes back up. All right, a quick review of a few other terms that may cross your screen in the Amplex. Protraction and retraction. You can practice this with your jaw right now. Protraction, sticking your jaw out. Sticking the mandible out, this part, the mandible. And then retraction. Retraction. This is a good thing to do when you're driving. Retract your jaw. Just put your finger on your jaw and push it back. You'll be surprised how far forward your head can be <laughs> when you're driving. Yeah, especially if it's a long trip. Go ahead, just push your chin back and think about retracting your jaw. Ooh, I just did it and I got an adjustment in my cervical spine. Also with the mandible, we have deviation, moving it from one side 
to the other. This is called the deviation of the jaw. And some people have a permanent deviation. They've got um, some anatomical structures that are off. Sometimes you see that side when the jaw drops, when it depresses, it actually goes to the side, one side or the other. But as that's called a deviation. And then uh, with the hands opposition. So what we do with our fingers when we touch them is in opposition. This is a movement called opposition. These are just review, hot second on this page, elevation of the scapula, depression of the scapula. So here, elevation, depression. Up, beautiful thing to do if you're feeling a little stressed, up, elevate your scapulas, squeeze that trap, squish it against your skull, your, imagine squishing against your lower ears, ah, squish, 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 and then whew, depress your scapulas. A little bit more open. Yeah, a little bit more open, creating space between the top of your scapulas and your occipital ridge. Adduction, adduction, add, ADD. See this right here? It's also known as retraction of the scapulas, but ADD, adduction of the scapulas. Better word is retraction, but adduction, what do we know about adduction? ADD, add. We're adding towards the midline of the body. That is why this is called adduction of the scapulas. It's moving towards the midline of the body. Abduction, better name protraction. Abduction, abduction. And some uh, graduates at school have said, oh, abduction, that's a weird way to say that. I just, I say it that way to be clear with you that I'm talking about abduction. So, or protraction, it's moving out, moving away from the spine. So throwing a punch moves that scapula out. We've talked about working the subscapularis and moving that scapula out, getting a little hook right underneath here. Right, if you can't see me, it's uh, right underneath the, um, the armpit. Abduction moving that scapula away from, protracting it away from the midline of the body. And this can be a little, little tricky, but I wanna cover it. Upward rotation, we are based on the, on the bottom part of your scapula. That is what's telling us if it's up or down, okay? Um, so if you see upward rotation, you know what muscles are involved, think about, the low half, right here, this lower half of the scapula of your shoulder blade, upward rotation, upward rotation. So you just need to know anatomically what this movement is based on. And that is based on the bottom part of your scapula. Downward rotation. So see how this side, this side is going up, This side is going, that's going down, but the acromion process is going up. Better way to look at it. The acromion process, which is on the very, very outside of the spine of the scap. We've actually seen this now, right? When we looked at the anatomy of the scapula, remember the spine of the scap? The spine of the scap is that bony landmark that tells us where the rotator cuffs are, right at the end of the spine of the scap is the acromion process. That's going up and rotating in. Look at the, the uh, this is the left scapula. Let's take a look at the right scapula as a demonstration of downward rotation. Again, that acromion process is going down, coming down. This is going up. So what muscles are involved in rotating that acromion process up? Just lift your shoulder up towards your ear. That's upward rotation of the scapula. So from anatomical position, lifting that left scapula up, upward rotation of the scapula. Now compared to abduction, abduction, 
where the scapula moves forward. Different set of muscles to throw a punch, right? To move that forward. Comparatively, downward rotation. Think about that acromion process again, right out here, bony landmark. How would you downwardly rotate? Take your hand if you're not driving or you're, if it's safe to do so. Take your right hand and put it behind your back, move it towards your left elbow. So if you take that hand, that right hand, move it behind you, that's downward rotation of the scapula. Feel free to review if you'd like to review. We're gonna skip this because I really wanna go into um, our, our dissecting the questions. We, we do very well. This is stuff you have seen before. Um, feel free to repeat it. Uh, and in your online learning center, in the anatomy and physiology upper body uh, module, all of this is covered in detail. Honestly, it's brain numbing. So elbow and forearm is also covered. Flexion and extension of the wrist, abduction and adduction. Again, having to do with adding to the midline of the body. We've covered these. It is worth just a quick nod towards anterior tilt, posterior tilt, and lateral tilt of the pelvis. These are things we treat. If you look at the pelvis, anterior tilt. And this is based on what's called the ASIS, the anterior superior iliac spine. So as you remember, this is the hip bones, their anatomical name is the ilium. And so the ilium has a little bony landmark. You can touch it on yourself. Just touch the front of your hips. Let's see if I can show you the hips. Ooh. So front of the hips. This is my left hip. Here is the top of my pelvis. If I work that down, right there is ASIS. Probably sounds familiar to you. All right, if my ASIS moves forward, that's an anterior tilt. Think of the pelvis. If we see, see this pelvis here on the far right, if we think of that as a bowl of soup, if you put your hands together like you had a bowl of soup in your hands, and as we take our hands apart, one is the, the ilium, if these are the iliums, we have two hips, right? And they come together and they make the pelvic basin. If we pull those apart and we say, like we had a cup of soup in our hands, if we spill the soup forward, spilling that soup forward at an anterior tilt. If we spill the soup backwards, so this is the pelvic basin, spilling the soup backwards. If we spilled our soup, like we went to drink it, and it spilled backwards, spilled onto us, that's a posterior tilt. You see it here in figure, in this middle figure, we've talked about the ASIS, it's pushed back. The ASIS has moved back, posterior tilt. In the long version of this A&P, I show you uh, kind of the old man pants, right? If you pull your pants up all the way over your belly button, that tells me your, your, your pelvis is actually posterior. It can tell me your posterior tilt. Think about what your belt would do if you have a belt and you pull that belt buckle up over your belly button. And the rest of the belt stayed kind of towards your tailbone. That belt would be illustrating what the pelvis is doing. All right. Gonna just cruise through these guys. Sorry, I really wanna get to um, our questions because we've only got about six minutes left. We had some systems to go through, um, some other planes of the body to go through. And we are just gonna jump right into our questions because they have to do with our application, our, our lecture for today. Okay. Boom, but a boom. How do I make this bigger? There we go. Oh, I can exit out of that. That's what I can do. And, all right. And hopefully you can see 
these questions. So do I need to redo that or can we see the questions? All right, first question is, the xiphoid process is blank to the navel. The xiphoid process is blank to the navel. So I hope you can see our questions. So the xiphoid process, let's answer. Oh, oh, we already got an answer in there. Oh, Jacob and Chet chiming right in. Whoop, whoop. Yes, based on the, and this is really the best way to describe that, that midline of the body stuff, Chet, that we were talking about nose to chin is superior and inferior. Much better way to, to describe that. Distal and proximal almost always refer to the limbs. So superior, if you get the option to answer superior or inferior, yes. So xiphoid process, for those of you who may be going, where the heck is a xiphoid process? Touch it on yourself, Whoop, touch it. Xiphoid process, right? It's at the end of the sternum. It's that little, little tail that we have at the end of our sternum. That's the xiphoid process. Look it up if you're seeing, if you're hearing it for the first time, pause, Google it, xiphoid process. But the xiphoid process at the end of the sternum and the navel. Best answer, D, superior. Good job. Number two, the plane of the body that divides upper and lower. The plane of the body that divides the body into upper and lower. So we're thinking whoosh, right across here, right? So the plane, the blank plane divides the body. Oh, here we go, got answers. I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna wait to look. A, transverse, B, frontal, C, coronal, D, sagittal. All right, anybody else wanna, oh, okay. Anybody else? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chime in, boom, boom, boom. Yes, I'm not gonna go through every plane of the body. The correct answer is A, transverse. Transverse, it cuts you in half, half. All right, question number three. A short, severe episode is referred to as blank. A short, severe episode is referred to as A, chronic, B, acute, C, terminal, D, minute or minute. A short, severe episode. Boom, boom, yes, B. The correct answer is B, acute. That is right. Um, chronic comes back again and again. Two more questions and then I will wrap up. In Western anatomical position. Okay, guys, here you go. In Western anatomical position, the human body is in what position? Now, these are the questions that sometimes freak people out because they're long. So we gotta get to the best answer. Best answer. A, standing erect. Facing forward, arms straight out, palms facing forward. This is where I expect you'll be doing something in your MLEX test. You'll be going into, you know, like following directions, standing erect, facing forward, arms at the side, palms facing forward, standing erect, facing forward, arms at the side, palms facing backward, standing erect, facing forward, arms bent at the elbow, palms facing up. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Oh. Oh, it's actually B. The correct answer is B. Because arms at our side, arms straight out. I know, best answer, honey, best answer. The say that is, now we're moving through these questions pretty quickly today in the interest of time. But this is an example of why, how some things look right. We actually have to do it. All right, last one, last question. The condition characterized by swelling, heat, redness, and pain is known as blank. A, chickenpox. B, fibromyalgia. 
C, Cushing syndrome, D, inflammation. Boom, boom, D, yes, the correct answer is D, inflammation. We can go back through those questions. If you're seeing the video, when you get the video, feel free to go back through those questions. We went through them pretty quickly and I don't recommend that actually uh, for your MBLEX experience, um, but yee-hoo, yeah, we got them, we got them done, we got them done. And again, just the practice of dissecting the question, the practice of looking for the best answer perfect example in that proximal and distal versus inferior and superior, right? So we just have to look for the best answer. Sometimes as we look for that best answer, it's gonna, the best, it's gonna be depends, right? Depends what four choices we get. So for the people watching the video, I am going to uh, sign off. My name is Jody Skulls. I am your overly enthusiastic, happy as a little puppy dog instructor uh, for the MBLEX review course. And I am delighted that you spent this time uh, reviewing the information, learning about the MBLEX and dissecting questions with us today. All right, hope to see you live soon. Peace out for the recording.